Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 20, verse 1. Here in verse 1 uh, through to 8, we have the Lord's authority challenged. Here we are on the third day in the last week of the Lord Jesus before his death on the cross. In this chapter, Luke gives us the final conflict the Lord had with organised religion. The Lord was teaching the people and preaching the good news in the temple when he was rudely interrupted. Notice who it was who interrupted him. It was the leading priests. It was the teachers of the religious law and the elders. People who should have known better. They questioned the Lord's authority to do the things he was doing and they were very intimidating. Look how the Lord deals with them in verses 3 and 4. He replied, Did John's authority to baptise come from heaven or was it merely human? They were not prepared to answer as they suddenly felt intimidated by him. They lamely replied that they didn't know. What an admission! They didn't know. They were were supposed to know everything. The Lord responds to their question by saying in verse 8, Then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. The Lord Jesus had been responding to the insincere rulers. Here were men who had seen the greatest miracles. They'd heard the greatest sermons and been in the presence of the greatest Saviour. And yet they would not believe. Not they could not, they would not. How sad. Strange when a person can be so near to heaven and yet be lost. Even so, there may have been others in the crowd that had similar questions but for different reasons. The Lord Jesus never refused to answer an honest question. In this next story, the Lord gives the answer to who he was and where his authority came from. Let's look at verses 9 to 19, the parable of the evil farmers. In verses 9 to 10, Uh, This story or parable was not intended to hide the truth, as was the case in Matthew chapter 13, but to show the truth. Here we have a man who plants a vineyard, who leases it to farmers, and at harvest time he sends one of his servants to uh, collect the share of uh, of the crop. What picture was the Lord showing those around him? The man who planted the vineyard is God. Uh, The vine represents the nation of Israel. Three trees symbolise the nation of Israel in the Bible, the vine, the fig and the olive. The vine represents Israel from its planting in the promised land until the nation rejected the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. Asaph in Psalm 80 verse 8 writes, You brought us from Egypt like a grapevine. You drove away the pagan nations and transplanted us into your land. You cleared the ground for us, and we took root and filled the land. By the time Jeremiah comes on the scene, it's a very different story. In chapter 2, verse 21, he says this, But I was the one who planted you, choosing a vine of the purest stock, the very best. How did you grow into this corrupt, wild vine? Look at Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. Now I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a rich and fertile hill. He ploughed the land, cleared its stones and planted it with the best vines. In the middle he built a watchtower and carved a winepress in the nearby rocks. Then he waited for a harvest of sweet grapes, but the grapes that grew were bitter. Now you people of Jerusalem and Judah, you judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard that, I've, that I have not already done? When I expected sweet grapes, why did my vineyard give me bitter grapes? Now let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will tear down its hedges and let it be destroyed. I'll break down its walls and let the animals trample it. I will make it a wild place where the vines are not pruned and the ground is not hoed. A place overgrown with briars and thorns. I'll command the clouds to drop no rain on it. 
The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven's armies. The people of Judah are his pleasant garden. He expected a crop of justice, but instead he found oppression. He expected to find righteousness, but instead he heard cries of violence. The fig tree represents Israel between the time of the Lord's rejection by Israel and the time of his return. The olive tree represents Israel as she will be in a coming day when the Lord sets up his kingdom on earth. The tenant farmers here in the story represent the leaders from Moses to David to the teachers of the present day who were there standing around Jesus. They had had godly leaders but they'd also had some wicked ones too. These present day leaders were cruel and corrupt beyond description. Look what happens to God's servants in verse 10, verse 11 and verse 12. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent one of his servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers attacked the servant, beat him up and sent him back empty handed. So the owner sent another servant, but they also insulted him, beat him up and sent him away empty handed. A third man was sent and they wounded him and chased him away. And so we have it, beat him up, beat him up, beat him up. That's what they did to the servants. Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 35 to 37 uh, puts it another way. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning, some were sawn in half, and others were killed with the sword. So we have the Jewish treatment of the prophets. In verses 13 through to 15, we have the Jewish treatment of the son. What will I do? The owner asked himself. I know, I'll send my cherished son. Surely they will respect him. But when the tenant farmers saw his son, they said to each other, Here comes the heir to this estate. Let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they dragged him out of the vineyard and murdered him. What an insight into the heart of God. He knew these people and how hard-hearted they were, but still he sent his only son into the world to reveal the love of God for them. Instead of respecting him, they were determined to get rid of him and refused to acknowledge his authority. The day before, the Lord Jesus had wept over Jerusalem. Read about that in chapter 19, verse 41. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. God never forces people to believe. And these leading priests, teachers of the law and elders, take part in nailing Jesus to the cross with the help of the Romans. Peter refers to this later in his sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The Lord knew all things that were going to happen to him. In verse 16, we have the results of treating the prophets and the Son of God as they did. This is what it says. I'll tell you, he will come and kill those farmers and lease the vineyard to others. In around 40 years time, this literally came true as the Roman army uh, came to Jerusalem under Titus. They started the siege of Jerusalem on the 14th of April, 70 AD. Titus destroyed the city of Jerusalem, including the temple, by September the 8th. The Jewish people were scattered. But God isn't finished with Israel. Remember the olive tree. In verse 17, Jesus looked at them and said, then what does this scripture mean? He pointed them back to Psalm 118 and verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This stone can be at the top of the wall that connects the two walls together or the foundation wall at the bottom. In 1 Kings chapter 5, we have the account of uh, the building of Solomon's temple. Solomon had 80,000 quarry workers. He had 70,000 labourers, 3,600 uh, foremen to supervise the work. 
as well as 30,000 men work in shifts in Lebanon. The temple was magnificent. Imagine the scene as the stones were being put into place there on Mount Moriah. They came across one particular stone which didn't seem to fit. They had all been prepared in the quarry. This stone was rejected and pushed down the hill from the temple site. Then they came to the missing stone and they call up the quarry to find out what the, it's already been delivered. The one they discarded. They quickly find the rejected stone and they, they, they find it, it just fits, just right, connecting the walls together. The cornerstone was the most important in the building as it would bond the walls together. Psalm 118 is accepted as the psalm about the Messiah, where this saying comes from. The Lord Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Yes, he was rejected by the Jews when he was here in this scene. He is still rejected by many today, but there is a day coming when he will be given his rightful place. Verse 18. Isaiah 8, 14 speaks of Messiah as a stone that makes people stumble and a rock that makes them fall. The religious leaders could never accept that the carpenter from Nazareth could be the Messiah. They couldn't see that anything good could come from Nazareth, from Galilee. They couldn't see the Messiah as a servant who would suffer. And so the Lord Jesus was the rejected stone. Jesus also refers to the future day when the nations who reject God will be judged. Verse 19, the great realisation. They realised he was telling the story against them. They were the wicked farmers. Their hatred of the Lord continued and instead of opening their eyes to see who he was, they continued in their rejection of him. In verses 20 to 26, we again see how dishonest these leaders are. They send spies to try and get Jesus to say something that will get him in trouble with the Roman governor. The well-quoted answer to the question, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not, amazed everybody and silenced his, his enemies. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. In verses 27 to 40, the Sadducees, a Jewish sect that started around 300 BC, they didn't believe in the supernatural and therefore the resurrection. They didn't believe all of the scriptures and together with the Pharisees were against the Lord Jesus. Many of the high priests were Sadducees and even after the death of Jesus, they were still persecuting the church. You check out Acts chapter 3 and 4. We don't read of any Sadducee ever coming to Jesus. Pharisees did, like Nicodemus, in John chapter 3. Later, the Apostle Paul, uh, he came uh, to, uh, to know Jesus. The Sadducees put a question to the Lord, thinking that they, had, that they at last had trapped him. They were not genuine questions, just questions to try and catch him out. God doesn't mind genuine questions that we might have. In verse 33, they outline a situation. It's described to us and it's rather bizarre to say the least. Seven brothers marry, married to one woman. The question, whose wife will she be in the resurrection, was put to the Lord Jesus. Basically, they said, get out of that one. In verse 34, Jesus responds. And Jesus isn't disturbed at all. The answer was quite simple. Marriage is for people here on earth. There'll be no need for marriage, no need for, to reproduce. Our bodies will be changed, 1 Corinthians 15, 35 to 57 speaks about that. We will be beyond the reach of sin and death. No more death, Revelation tells us. The problem with the Sadducees was that they were ignorant of God's word. They didn't accept the truth of the resurrection isn't that what we see today? People all around us still question the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, some uh, even in the so-called church. In verse 36, it tells us, And they will never die again. Believers will be in their eternal home with their Saviour, with nothing to fear. We will have, have glorified bodies like the Lord Jesus had after his resurrection. He was recognised by uh, the followers but was never to die again. 
Moses and Elijah were both recognisable. We shall know one another in heaven. In verse 37 and 38, it says this, But now, as to whether the dead will be raised, even Moses proved this when he wrote about the burning bush. Long after Abraham, Isaac and Jacob had died, he referred to the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. So he is the God of the living, not the dead, for they are all alive to him. He isn't through with these Sadducees who are sneering at him. They had their human logic, but their knowledge was so limited without God's word. He knew. He then takes them back to Moses. And there in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6, he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. At this point in history, all three had been dead for a few hundred years. The Sadducees would say, very much dead. Jesus said, no, very much alive, because God is the God of the living. He's not the God of people who, who no longer exist. A God who only rules over the dead might just as well be dead himself. Unbelievers will face the second death, eternal separation from God. They will exist, but not with God. But believers will be eternally alive with him. Billy Graham, the evangelist, said this when speaking about his own death. Someday you will read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe a word of it. I shall be more alive than I am now. I will have just have changed my address. I will have gone into the presence of God. In verses 39 to 40, the Sadducees were silenced and, and everyone was gobsmacked. In verse 41 to 44, we read these, uh, these words. Then Jesus presented them with a question. Why is it, he asked, that the Messiah is said to be the son of David? For David himself wrote in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honour at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Since David called the Messiah Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? What is the answer to this question that the Lord put to the Sadducees? He is David's Lord because he is the eternal God. He is David's son because he became man. He chose to come into this world, born of the daughter of David's line, a virgin called Mary. So Jesus is both David's son and his Lord. Why was the Lord saying these things? He was forcing the, the teachers of the law and the Sadducees to acknowledge from the scriptures that the son of David was also the son of God. They couldn't deny that he was the son of David. People had often called him the son of David. Once again, his enemies were left speechless. As this chapter closes in verses 45 to 47, we see how the Lord points out the hypocrisy of the teachers of the religious law. So, we have the enemies of the Lord who are still unable to catch the Son of God out, but are determined to get rid of him. The work that the Father had sent him into the world to do, to be the saviour of the world, was now very close at hand. I wonder today, who do you think Jesus is? I believe he's the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But I also believe that he died for you too. And he longs for you to trust him as your saviour from sin. Why not this very moment ask the living Lord Jesus who loved you and died for you, who rose again the third day, who lives for you in heaven. Why not trust him, take him as your saviour. You'll never regret it. Let's pray. Father, indeed, we want to uh, thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, you reveal yourself through your word. And we thank you that you sent the Lord Jesus into this world to be our saviour. We pray, Lord, that each of us might know that uh, we uh, are yours, uh, not through anything that we've done, but because we've simply put our trust, our faith in what Jesus did for us there on the cross. We thank you that as we uh, think uh, this morning as, uh, of uh, these uh, people who uh, saw the Lord 
in person and yet uh, they uh, rejected the evidence. We pray, Lord, that uh, we would learn from them and that we would recognise who the Lord Jesus is and what he's done for each of us. We thank you, Lord, for uh, this uh, time. We thank you for uh, your word and we pray that uh, we would get into it and uh, we pray that we wouldn't be ignorant, but we would take your word for what it is, the very word of God, uh, truth, and uh, truth that needs to be taken in and to be acted upon. Lord, we uh, pray for our fellowship. We pray, Lord, that you would bless each, uh, each one and uh, those connected with us. We uh, ask, Lord, for your blessing on them. And for those who need uh, uh, special help at this time, we pray that they might uh, know your, uh, your very special presence. And so we thank you for all that you've done for us. And uh, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.